How's everyone today? Thanks for being here. I have notes, I apologize. I'm gonna to have to not read, but I have to reference. Can art and storytelling express our shared humanity of who we are and where we came from? How do we learn to incorporate life experiences into our art and how we tell our stories? What would happen if we accepted perspectives different from our own as valid and important in their own right? Eight years ago, I lost my best friend, my little brother, Mike. He died from a gunshot wound to the chest. It was self-inflicted. His death shocked us all. He had colleagues, he had friends, he had a close family, he had me. Yet none of us saw it coming. To say I had a difficult time adjusting to life without him would be an understatement. As the weeks passed after his death, I struggled to vocalize my feelings. I felt I had lost my own voice when his was silenced. In that time, I found myself aimlessly driving and listening to his favorite bands. The voices of Chris Cornell, Scott Weiland, and Lane Staley echoed in the clunky Nissan he helped me purchase just two years prior. One late afternoon, as I drove through the tree-lined streets of suburban Philadelphia, the voice of Mike's idol, Eddie Vedder, flowed through the speakers. Yes, I understand that every life must end. As we sit alone, I know someday we must go. Stay with me. You're all I see. Did I say that I need you? Did I say that I want you? Well, if I didn't, I'm a fool, you see. No one knows this more than me. I was stunned. Eddie Vedder found the words to say what I was struggling to say about Mike. Did I say that I need you? Did I say that I want you? The song, Just Breathe, was from Pearl Jam's 2009 album, Backspacer, an album Mike would never hear. It's funny because all I wanted to do was talk to him about it. I wonder if he would have liked the album. I think he would. Eddie Vedder didn't write that song for me or even to ex express the feelings of loss. Many people in interpret the lyrics differently. In fact, the song is quite popular as a first dance song in wedding celebrations. The line, stay with me, you're all I see, means something quite different when sung by two people in love. We don't really know why Eddie Vedder wrote Just Breathe. In Pearl Jam fandom, there's much debate about the meaning of the song. Think about it. What does that song mean to you? As with all forms of art, one's interpretation of it is quite personal. Mike's death redefined my worldview and continues to shape what I bring to every new experience I encounter. And I'm not alone. Each of us brings our own life experience to our understanding of the world. I work in a museum. In fact, I work in an incredible museum in Philadelphia called the Penn Museum. It is the largest university museum in all of North America. We have over one million objects in our collection from around the world. And through those objects, we strive to tell stories of universal importance, stories that everyone can relate to, understand, and care about. In 1888, the museum excited, excavated the site of Nippur in modern-day Iraq. The archaeologists found over 30,000 cuneiform tablets there, hidden beneath the surface. Given the volume of the find, they thought they had found the world's first library. Upon further evidence, they translated and researched the tablets, and they realized that that was not true. They hadn't found the first library, but what they did find was a repository of a different kind. It did contain literature, but the tablets also contained evidence of daily life, of receipts for livestock, for grains, for dyes, and for people. It even contained exam examples of how children learned how to write. We are currently rethinking the stories we tell with objects from the Middle East, those cuneiform tablets included. In a current exhibition at our museum called Cultures in the Crossfire, Stories from Syria and Iraq, we present objects from that collection to explore the destruction of cultural heritage sites in the Middle East. You've all seen footage of objects being destroyed in Palmyra and Aleppo and other sites in the region. How do we deal with this unprecedented loss? What happens when our shared history vanishes? How do we understand it then? We would like you to understand and appreciate those questions, but as museum storytellers, we cannot predict what the audience will bring to their understanding of our work. We don't innately know if you are a refugee from Syria or a resident of the United States when you visit our museum. We don't know if you're a man or a woman, if you're Roman Catholic or Sunni Muslim, or who you voted for in the last election. We couldn't possibly know that. But even if we did understand how you self-identify, we wouldn't know the experience you bring to the stories that we're telling you. Topics and stories that resonate strongly with one person 
may be found offensive or relevant to another. And that's okay. That's part of what it means to be human. Last autumn, I visited the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam for the first time. This museum, as you might guess, highlights the work of Vincent Van Gogh, the infamous post-impressionistic painter who cut off his left ear in creative madness. His work is popular. He created over 2,000 paintings in his lifetime. I'm sure you all know it. He painted Starry Night and Sunflowers, two of the most notable paintings in history. He used bold colors and painted with thick brush strokes and in mesmerizing, swirling patterns. His work is typically presented as important art. We are told to appreciate his technique, his focus, his aggressive brush strokes, and the serene landscapes he created. Recently, that museum organized a special exhibition called On the Verge of Insanity, Van Gogh and His Illness, and it took a different approach. The labels next to the, ex the paintings in this exhibition told the story of his mental illness. They had flipped the traditional narrative, and the visitor was asked to experience his art through his suffering. Incorporated into the labels were the stories of his stays in asylums, of his suicide attempts, of his altercations with people. Unlike any other of its kind, in this exhibit you could read the pain-laden words of helpless friends and family in archival letters, and you saw the suffering in his paintings. This change in narrative laid bare his humanity. It was remarkable, and to this day it is the best exhibition I've ever seen. With this new understanding of his life experience, I experienced his paintings differently. The same can be said for the songs that we encounter throughout our lifetimes. Sometimes our personal experience changes the song's meaning, as Pearl Jam's Just Breathe did for me. But the meaning of art can be altered by presenting and representing it and, and interpreting it differently. In 1967, Bob Dylan wrote All Along the Watchtower while recovering from a motorcycle accident. Dylan's version didn't make it onto the charts, but the following year, Jimi Hendrix covered the song using tone and effects that hadn't been heard before and with a guitar solo that was unstoppable. Hendrick's version becomes one of the greatest cover songs of all time and produced the raw, unfiltered sound of a generation. Around the same time, Otis Redding released a song about a desperate man pleading with his woman to give him a little respect at the end of the day. His song was popular on the Black Singles chart and had crossover appeal. Two years later, a producer brought the same song to the attention of a little-known gospel singer named Aretha Franklin. He thought that the song would bring attention to her vocal ability, and he was right. Aretha's rendition of respect turned her into a feminist icon. She did not ask for a little respect from her man. She demanded it, so much so that she spelled it out literally, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. This context changed the meaning of that song. As artists, we share the story of our human experience in many ways, in painting, drama, sculpture, poetry, literature, hip-hop, and rap. We interpret and interpret. As humans, we make content, we take content. We shape and reshape it. We borrow from each other, we steal from one another. We make that content reflect our times. We look to keep you invested in our work. From the cuneiform tablets to the art of Van Gogh to the songs of Pearl Jam, we create with intent. I hurt myself today to see if I still feel. Those words were written and sung by Trent Reznor of the band Nine Inch Nails. He was wading through severe depression and riddled with drug addiction when it was released in 1995. Shortly after its release, Spin Magazine named Reznor the most vital artist in music. The song Hurt became an instant 1990s classic, but not nearly as classic as it would become when country music legend Johnny Cash covered it towards the end of his career in 2003. Reznor's version, excellent in its own right, was the expression of a 20-something experienced pain for the first time, perhaps. But when the 70-something man in black sang the same lyrics, a profoundly deeper and more universal meaning was exposed. I hurt myself today to see if I still feel. Cash died seven months after the song was released. Art, in all forms, can take on a life of its own. It is created out of a sense of obligation, of passion, of a need to express but it can be remixed, reused, and reinterpreted. It is not limited to the lifetime of its creator. It can be reincarnated, and I think it should be. But the question remains, can we instill in our audiences a universal understanding and appreciation of the art and the stories we tell? Of course not, nor should we. We must embrace the perspectives and points of view and experiences each person brings to their understanding of the work we produce 
but we cannot predict it. What resonates for you may not be what resonates for me. That's why we need Bob Dylan's version with Jimi Hendrix's version. We need Otis Redding and Aretha Franklin, both Trent Reznor and Johnny Cash. Cash's music video for Hurt was filmed in his home and museum called the House of Cash. At the time of the filming, the museum had been closed for a long time. The video shows dusty memorabilia, broken platinum records, and once curated photographs documenting a remarkable career piled up in the corner on the floor. His wife, June, looks on in the distance. There's a close to the public sign on the door. Cash died within a year of its filming, and the museum burnt down several years later. But it was rebuilt in 2013, and his story was retold. Walking through the galleries, you see his guitars, bits of his black wardrobe, his handwritten song lyrics, and other bits of personal memorabilia, including the Grammy that he won for the video of Hurt. In fact, it's the last thing that you see when you walk through the museum. Reznor said regarding Cash's version of his song, I wrote some words and music in my bedroom as a way of staying sane, about a bleak and desperate place I was in, totally isolated and alone. Somehow that winds up reinterpreted by a music legend from a radically different era and still retains sincerity and meaning. Different, but every bit is pure. It really made me think about how powerful music is as a medium and an art form. My brother's death redefined my understanding of the world. What experiences have shaped your understanding of it? What experiences will shape your future understanding of it? The truth is you don't know. We don't know what the future holds. But we do know that new experiences will shape us, just as past experiences already have. We all have that in common. That's humanity. Thank you. <laughs>